welcome back. We have for the past three uh, classes been discussing states of matter, where in the past three classes we looked at different kinds of intermolecular interactions. So, at this point one should be able to given a molecule to identify what is the intermolecular interaction that is uh, present and also to be able to deduce given a list of molecules where some property arrange them in an order of some physical property based on the intermolecular interactions that are present in the molecules. So, now what we will do is to look at properties of gases. In the last class when we closed, we said that gases, the reason to study it, although if you looked at the periodic table, there are only 11 elements that exist as gases. So, if you thought about it, you would say what is the importance to study gases? After all, there are 11 elements only uh, that are naturally present as gases. But we mentioned that there are various reasons of uh, for studying gases fundamentally and practically. So, with that without further maybe I should just reintroduce it fundamentally that there are no intermolecular interactions or no or little intermolecular interactions in gases. which means that you can almost get an ideal system for study obviously the practical importance that we live in a blanket of the atmosphere which is gases which is made up of gases and in modern day there is this environmental effect which involves reaction in the gas phase. And fourthly, number of classic experiments which established fundamental things in chemistry were done with gases. So, we will start our discussion by looking at one fundamental experiment that was done and that is due to Robert Boyle. Robert Boyle did this in 1862. So, I will first explain this experiment. The result that he concluded from this experiment was a relationship between pressure and volume of a fixed mass of gas at constant temperature. So, that is the relationship that he established. It is interesting to see how this experiment works. So, Robert Boyle, if you looked at the history, Robert Boyle lived around the same time, a little bit before maybe, of um, Isaac Newton and Robert Hooke. So, there is most of the experiment that Robert Boyle talks about were done by Robert Hooke who was an assistant and Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton have a very interesting history in that well that is something that you could read up the relationship between Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton. But in any case, so the experiments that we are going to discuss are the experiments done by Robert Boyle. So, what is this experiment that he did? You have to also realize that Robert Boyle did this experiment around the time when Torricelli came in. Torricelli had done the manometer, the mercury manometer. So, what the experimental 
uh, equipment that Robert Boyle used is what is called a J tube. He uses two things, one is a U tube and the other is a J tube. So, the first one is a U tube. So, let us take a cylindrical tube like that, which is closed at one end and open at the other. So, this is a glass tube. of fixed diameter uh, very accurately. So, fixed dia and it is closed at one end. I am discussing this in detail because it is I think it is a very interesting experiment and you have to put yourself in the shoes of um, Robert Boyle in 1862, I remind the date. So, what he does is to pour mercury in through here and he poured as much mercury such that the, he starts off with mercury to such an extent that on both sides of this U tube, the heights were the same. So, you start with this thing. So, that is the initial point and then to this you add more mercury on the open side, from the open side. So, you measure, so behind this he puts a scale and he measures the height of this empty volume. So, you have mercury from here to here, there is atmosphere acting from here and there is this space in which there is a gas which he has confined. Usually in his case it was atmosphere and now, so this is the first experiment. So, for when this, vol when the heights of the mercury in the both the arms were the same, he measures some volume and volume he measures is related to the height of this, height of the gas filled space. Now, the next thing that he does is to add more mercury in from the top here and he did a series of experiments, he kept adding more and more mercury and then he, when you add more mercury here, you will have more mercury here, you add more mercury in here and this mercury will move and this volume will get reduced. So, the reduce, the volume occupied by the gas will change as you add more and more mercury. So, you have two things that you measure, you measure this height, that is the height of the or height or the volume of the space occupied by the gas and the difference in height between the two layers of mercury in the two arms of this U tube manometer. So, this is the experiment that Robert Boyle did and here is his original data. So, he has two things, one is the number of spaces. in the short leg of the manometer, that is in this, this is the number of spaces. So, this measures the volume occupied by the gas and the other thing that he does is to measure the height or the height difference between the two mercury levels. And he has a third column which is this height which I call h plus 29.1 inches. We will come to that in a moment. So, when this pressure when the heights of the two arms of the manometer tube were 0, the difference, the space 
the space that you have is given by some unit which is called 48, let whether it is inches or whatever it is, it does not make a difference. And h plus 29.1 is 29.1 inches. Why do we have this 29.1 inches? This 29.1 inches comes as a result of the following thing, which I will just discuss. So, what he did was he did another experiment where we had a tube like this, much the same thing. He opened this to the atmosphere, he filled this with liquid mercury, he filled this with liquid mercury and this one he attached it to a vacuum pump. And it is very interesting because it was just a little bit prior to this that von Guerich had determined or had made the vacuum pump. So, what he did was he took this tube like this, filled it with mercury and he hooked it up to a pump. So, on one side of this, this tube, you have a vacuum or as good a vacuum as Robert Boyle would get and on the other side, it was open to the atmosphere. So, this height difference that he measures in this e experiment corresponds to 29.1 inches. So, this 29.1 inches that he adds on essentially corresponds to the height of the mercury column corresponding to this atmospheric pressure. Yeah? So, this is the 29.1 inches that he adds on and arises from here. Okay? And so, let us go back and look at his data. So, when the spaces were 48, the height difference between the two levels, the two arms of the manometer, or two arms or legs or whatever you want to call it was 0 and this is 29.8 inches because if you had vacuum on one side and the atmosphere, that is the difference. So, that is 29.1 inches. We will just look at some data. 44, when this separation, when this volume is occupied by the gas is 44 this height difference is 2.8 and when you add this thing, this is 31.9 inches. With 40, 6.2, 35.3, 36, just to give you a, a sense of the kind of numbers that he got. And Robert Boyle is very interesting because he was a very good experimentalist. So, as a chemist, it is good to follow some of Robert Boyle's work because of the high level of experimentation that he has done. 44.2, and 50.3. That is the kind of data that he got and he got, he went on and it with there is a lot more data that he had with I think units of force separation in the volume. So, he had he added as much as he, as you would get a 4, four inch difference in the volume. And now, what do you do? If you plotted this first column here versus the third column here. So, if I plot volume in the units of the space occupied by the gas. Versus the height plus 29.1 inches of mercury. If you plot this, the points that he gets looks like this somewhat. I am not doing a very good job of it, but qualitatively you know what is going on. So, if you plotted this, what you see is a hyperbolic dependence of the volume. So, this is the volume with the pressure. So, when the pressure is low, the volume is high 
and when the pressure increases, the volume drops. So, there is this hyperbolic dependence of the pressure on the volume, which this is what that, that Robert Boyle found. That is, for constant mass, so in his case atmosphere, at constant T, he finds that V is proportional to 1 over P. So, if you wanted to do it differently, another way, which is what most of us would do, is to rather than look at this, because you could have more than one function which shows this decrease. If you plot V versus 1 over P, then you get a straight line. That is a better, easier plot to understand. So, if you take this and you take 1 over P, so 1 over the height. If you did this, you will get a plot which looks like that. And for, so what you are going to find is that P V equal to a constant k. And this k, what we are saying is, it is a function of the temperature and the mass of the gas. So, this is the first experiment of Robert Boyle, which tells you that there is a relationship between the volume of the occupied by the gas and it is proportional to 1 over the pressure. Okay? So, the next experiment that we look at is the dependence of volume on the temperature. And this was done by Jacques Charles in 1790 and by Joseph Gay-Lussac in 1802. Well, it is interesting, but Jacques Charles is probably was not a scientist. He was interested in ballooning and he was looking at the volume of the balloon when you heated the gas that, that you used to blow up the balloon. And what Charles and Gay-Lussac measured was that again for constant mass or fixed mass and constant temperature, what Charles measured was to take a balloon or something with which contains a fixed mass of gas and constant pressure. What he did was to take a balloon at constant pressure, atmospheric pressure and look at its volume at when it is immersed in ice which would correspond to 0 Celsius and to look at its volume when immersed in boiling water. Which is 100 Celsius. So, he does, they do two experiments to measure the volume, well they do not measure the volume, they measure delta V, that is the volume difference of a balloon which has a fixed amount of gas at constant pressure. The constant pressure is atmospheric pressure. So, you put it in ice, you measure the volume and you do the same thing by putting this balloon in boiling water at 100 degrees. And they find that delta V, that is the difference in, is proportional to delta T. This is what Charles found. And the story goes that in the Western world, Jacques Charles, by the way, is a Frenchman. 
and the story goes and if you looked at most textbooks, this is called Charles's law. It turns out that um, an Englishman by the name by Peter Guthrie Tate saw the last name and imagined that this person was an Englishman and wanted to attribute it to an Englishman. So, rather than give it a French name, he called it Charles law, when in fact it was done by Gay Lussac, who was French. So, this is the problem with the English versus the French. So, Guthrie Tate wanted to give the credit to Charles, imagining that he was an Englishman, when in fact both Charles as well as Gay Lussac were French. Okay, so finally. Delta V is proportional to delta T. This is what Jacques Charles found, some k prime delta T call it. Now, Gay Lussac did a similar experiment, except he measured the ratio of the volumes of the gas, a fixed amount of gas at two different temperatures. So, he measures V2 over V1, and he found that this ratio no matter what the gas was, this ratio between at 100 degree Celsius boiling water over that at 0 degree Celsius, this ratio was 1.375 and this is independent of the gas. So, it is independent of the gas, but for a fixed amount of gas, this ratio works out to be 1.375 is what Gay Lussac found. It turns out that now this number is slightly different. We would say this ratio is about 1.366, something like that. Okay? So, what do we get? We get if you plotted V as a function of, so we are saying that if you looked at V, as a function of t, we have a straight line. We are saying that you measure this at some point, call it 0 degrees. So, this is where you measure 0 degrees Celsius. This is what Charles's experiment will tell you, and you measure this. This is what, and this is 100 degrees. And we are saying that Gay Lussac measures this slope. This slope he measures to be 1.375. So, if I draw a line with this slope or 1.366 if you if you want to do it now. So, Jacques Schall measures this difference V1, this delta V. And he says it does not matter what as long as you have delta T, this thing is delta V is this much, whereas Gay Lussac measures V2 over V1, and this ratio is this. So, you can get the slope, and importantly, if you extrapolate it down to 0 volume, this temperature works out to be minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. This would correspond to the temperature at which the gas has 0 volume. Right? All that I have done is taken this ratio of V2 over V1, which gives me the slope, and this extrapolated it to a temperature where this volume is 0, and this point corresponds to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So, this is something, this is when you are learning gases or when you are doing thermodynamics, this is something that one needs to stress. So, this temperature, so you will see typically at least in most Indian settings, you will find that you will find temperature reported in degree Celsius. That is one way of doing it or often when you are talking at gases, we use this point where this goes to 0, where the volume goes to 0 to be the 0 point and this corresponds to Kelvin. So, this point where the, temp, uh, the volume of the gas the occupied by the gases is 0 corresponds to 0 of a new scale of temperature which is called the Kelvin. 
and to convert from degree Celsius to Kelvin, you will say degree Celsius because it is 273.15 degrees below the freezing point of water. So, degrees to centigrade plus 273.15 would give you the temperature in Kelvin. So, in most calculations involving the um, gases, you would be using Kelvin where you take degree Celsius and you add 273.15 to it. Okay. Maybe this because we have introduced units, we should also look at the units that are used for volume and pressure. The SI unit of volume is meter cube. This is a very large quantity and most gases for example, that we look at will not have very large numerical value of the volume in SI units. So, very often you will come across other units for volume. For example, you might come across the volume expressed as decimeter cube. And we know that 1 decimeter equals 0.1 meter. So, 1 decimeter cube is 10 to the minus 3 meter cube. You will also often come across the unit of volume of liter, which is 1000 centimeter cube. And we know that 100 centimeters is 1 meter. So, this allows you to convert from meter to decimeter to centimeter and also as a result allows you to convert from centimeter cube to liters to decimeter cube and meter cube. You might also come across a unit of volume which is milliliters which is 10 to the minus 3 of a liter. The units of pressure are even more interesting and varied. So, the units of pressure that Robert Boyle used is inches of mercury. What this means is that he is measuring the length of the mercury column in the manometer. So, to convert from the pressure expressed in inches of mercury to the real pressure unit, you will have to take the height of the manometer column in whatever unit is, is expressed times the density of the fluid which is in the manometer times the gravity due to earth. So, this h is the height of the fluid in the manometer d is the density of the fluid and g is gravity of earth. So, the product of the height times the density times the gravity of earth will give you the pressure in appropriate units. Now, it could also be that sometimes instead of inches of mercury, you might see centimeters of mercury or millimeters of mercury, but to come get from any one of these to the pressure is exactly the same except that you have to ensure that the density and the gravity of earth are in the right units. If you do this, then you will be able to get the pressure in the appropriate units. So, this is something that you have to take care of when you are doing calculations involving the properties of gases. The next unit that you will come across for the pressure is the atmosphere 
and one atmosphere corresponds to 760 millimeters of mercury. The other unit that you will come across is the Pascal, which is the SI unit of pressure. And because the Pascal is such a small quantity, 10 to the 5 Pascal is written as P A is given another unit of a bar. So, you should be in principle be able to convert from millimeters of mercury to atmospheres to uh, Pascal and to bar. And you can figure out what the Pascal is. So, pressure is force per unit area. So, this in and this is mass times acceleration. So, mass in the area. So, that will be kilogram meter per second square divided by meter square. So, that is the unit of Pascal in SI. And so, it is important that you be able to do this and very often in calculations involving volume in liters, you will see liter and atmospheres and things like that. So, it is also important that you know the units of the gas constant in these things. Okay, so, let us now with this introduction of the units of volume, temperature and pressure, let us go back to where we were. We looked at Boyle's law, which gives you the relationship of pressure to volume, right, where you say that if you have a mass, a fixed mass at constant temperature, there is a relationship between the pressure and the volume. So, let us see if we can, let us take an example to see if we can apply this. So, sulfur dioxide gas is important as it uh, plays a central role in acid rain. So, imagine that I take sulfur dioxide gas and there is uh, 1.53 liters. So, I have 1.53 liters of SO2 gas at a pressure of 5.6 times 10 to the 3 Pascal and pressure is changed to 1.5 times 10 to the 4 Pascal. What is the volume? occupied by SO2 gas under the new conditions. So, how do we go about it? We know that at the initial pressure, which we call P 1, which is 5.6 times 10 to the 3 Pascal, the volume occupied by sulfur dioxide is 1.53 liters. And we are saying that what is we are asking for at a new pressure of 1.5 times 10 to the 4 Pascal, what is the volume, right? So, we know that P and V are inversely related. So, P 
is proportional to 1 over v or v is proportional to 1 over v. So, we have p 1 v 1 must equal p 2 v 2 or you can write it the other way around which is p 2 by p 1 is equal to v 1 by v 2. So, we know we know this, we know this, we know this and we are asked to compute this straightforward. So, v 2 is p 1 v 1 over p 2 and you plug in the numbers and you should be able to compute this. And let us look at one example of the Charles law. A sample of gas at 15 degree Celsius and one atmospheric pressure has a volume of 2.58 liters. What volume will this gas occupy at 38 degrees Celsius and one at atmospheric pressure. So, we know that V is proportional to T. So, V 1 by T 1 equals V 2 by T 2, but note these are given temperatures are given in degree Celsius. So, we say temperature in Kelvin. So, T 1 is 273.15 plus 15 Kelvin, T 2 is 273.15. Very often we will drop the 1 5. and the volume is initially 2.58 liters. So, we say 2.58 liters over 288.15 Kelvin is equal to V 2 in liters over 27 and 2, 3, 311 point one five Kelvin. Uh, it is a good practice to carry the units along when you do this, otherwise well in this particular case it may not be important, but it is good idea to carry this along, because then you know that when you multiply this out for example, your units come out to be right. Very often what happens is at the end of the calculation you do not know what the units you are dealing with. So, in this particular case for example, you will say V 2 is equal to 311.15 Kelvin over 288.15 Kelvin times 2.58 liters. So, this units automatically pop out if you carry the units along when you do this multiplication. So, I think it is good practice. Keep the units when you do the mathematical manipulations. the algebraic manipulations. Okay. Right. So, now we know what Boyle's law is, we know Charles law, we are able to apply it in situations. Let us move on.
The next thing that we come along and we see is very critical, but easily ignored is the Avogadro's hypothesis. This is a critical thing in this whole story. Gay Lussac, somebody we have already come across, had done an experiment where he found that equal volumes, what he found was that when gases react, they react, the volumes that they react are in simple or small ratios or something to that effect. That when you have reaction involving gases, the ratio of the volumes that are um, reacting is in small proportion. And this is the information that Avogadro had. And what Avogadro proposed was that equal volumes, Amadeo Avogadro, that is the name. Avogadro proposed based on Gay Lussac's experiment that equal volumes, this is a very, very important thing, equal volumes of all gases at constant T and P contain equal number of molecules or same number of molecules. This is very important and I believe Avogadro's uh, proposal came somewhere around 1800 if I am not mistaken approximately. I do not know the exact date, but I think it is around the time of 1800. And obviously, Avogadro's hypothesis was strongly rejected by most people, but it was Canizzaro, Stanislav Canizzaro in 1862 who provided conclusive evidence of the Avogadro hypothesis, which was when it was first accepted after Canizzaro's explanation. The problem was that Dalton did not agree with Avogadro's hypothesis. Dalton had already proposed the atomism, atomic hypothesis that every substance is made up of undivisible particles called atoms and every particle in a molecule or in a gas has the same mass. So, Dalton was unable to explain what Avogadro proposed, but now in hindsight it is easy enough to understand. So, what we say now is the mass of a gas So, the molecule has a particular mass, call it m. And so, if you have Avogadro number of particles, so the mass of a gas is proportional, is, e is proportional to the mass and this number of particles will determine the mass of the gas. So, different gases will have different m. So, if you take the same volume, if the number of particles is the same, so you would take, if you take nitrogen which is occupies 1 liter and you take hydrogen which occupies 3 liters, so you have this N2 and 3H2 reaction to give you 2NH3. So, you have 1 liter of this, 3 liters of this and the pressure is the same. So, the number of particles would be 3 times more here 
and the mass of this gas is because this has a different molecular composition. The mass would be different, so the mass of the gas would be different, but the number of particles would be the same. So, this required a lot of things before it was accepted. So, we have three things now. We have that V is proportional to P, this is due to Boyle, V is proportional to T, this is due to Charles and Gay Lussac. and V is proportional to N, this is the Avogadro hypothesis. V is well, ah, sorry, 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 yes, it just pointed out that I made a mistake here, V is proportional to 1 over P, thank you. Yes, that was a mistake, V not proportional to P, V proportional to 1 over P, yes, and Avogadro hypothesis. So, do we have an example of this? It is a very interesting way of doing this. So, if you did a bicycle pump for example, right? if you take a bicycle pump and you pump air into your tube, that is a clear cut example of the application of Avogadro law. So, imagine that you have a pump whose volume is some 500 ml and every time you lower the pump, then 500 ml gets forced into the cycle tube and the tube expands. So, obviously, V is proportional to N, a straightforward implementation of Avogadro's law, although the temperature does change because of adiabatic compression, but let us not worry about that. Okay. Let us take another practical use of this. Uh, maybe there is an example that I have somewhere. Okay. One place where this is used is in airbags. You might have come across, even if your family does not own a car, you may have come across advertisements on the TV where they say that cars are advertised with airbags and it is a safety device. So, if you the safety device is the following. So, if your car undergoes a collision, the moment there is an impact to save the people, passengers, the driver and the passenger in the car, when this thing hits, what happens is uh, a bag which contains something opens up, it is filled with gas and so rather than you go and hit some hard object, you hit this let us say a cushion or a pillow containing air and you break this damage by, you reduce the damage by going and hitting colliding on this pillow of air. And this is a very straightforward implementation of the gas laws, so or actually the Avogadro hypothesis. So, imagine that I have an air bag of volume 36 liters. So, what are we saying? We are saying, so we are going to when this thing, so think of this device. So, I come, the car comes and hits something. When you hit something like this, you are going to get a pillow whose volume is 36 liters and you want to fill it with the gas of 36 liters with nitrogen gas at 1.15 atmospheres, which is about atmospheric pressure and 26 degrees Celsius. So, that is the temperature in that place when this car hits. Huh? And we would like to, and the way it works is that the reaction that happens is sodium azide when it undergoes this compression. So, you have this is a solid sodium azide is a solid and it will liberate a molecule of N2 gas. So, the key is if you want, so this is the reaction in any case, if for every mole of NaN3 solid which decomposes, you get one mole of N2 gas. 
and so what we are saying is how much of sodium azide must be decomposed to get this nitrogen gas at 1.15 atmospheres and 26 degrees Celsius to occupy 36 liters. This is an interesting question, right? And what does this airbag involve? It says the, the idea is very simple. When the collision happens, you have this occupies very little volume because it is a solid. It, it uses a lot of the things that we have learned this far. This is very little volume. So, inside your car in the front for example, in the steering wheel, you have something which has a small amount of sodium azide. And when this thing collides, this sodium azide undergoes this reaction and it liberates nitrogen. And when nitrogen happens, it happens instantaneously, this is a gas, it will go and fill the volume of the container. And that is exactly what is happening. So now, so now when this thing fills up instantaneously, you go and hit this thing and this thing has blown up. So you do not hit against the steering wheel or against the, the glass shield. So this uses the fact that the gas occupies lot more volume. So now under these conditions at constant T and P etcetera, we want to know what is the number of nitrogen, number of moles of nitrogen gas that we need to have to satisfy this situation. 36 liters at 1.15 atmospheres and 26 degrees Celsius. And then given that we calculate N here, we can work backwards and determine what is the amount of sodium azide a very, very simple implementation of gas laws in a very, very practical situation. So, that is what we need to do. So, now what we need to do is to couple the Boyle, Charles and Avogadro law to get an, a gas law, which we will call the ideal gas equation of state. So, in the next class, we will look at the ideal gas equation of state, which relates, which uses V proportional to T, V proportional to 1 over P and V proportional to N to get one equation. You can work that out already, right? And you already know that. And that is the ideal gas equation of state, which is P V equal to N R T, which we will discuss in the next class. Thank you.